Real estate investment practice problem using Excel. Decision to purchase home or rent calculation. New format, part number five. Get ready because we're raising the stakes with real estate. Here we are in our Excel worksheet. If you have access to the Excel worksheet, would like to follow along. Note there's four tabs on down below. Example, practice, blank, and the pivot table tab. Let's take a look at them now, starting with the example tab, in essence being the answer key. So you can always go back to the example tab to take a look at the formatting as you work through the practice problem. The second tab, the practice tab, will have the pre-formatted worksheets that you can use to work through the practice problem with a little less formatting involved. The third tab, this is where we're working the blank tab. Now we've gone through the whole problem at this point in time. We wanna do a little bit more analysis on this last worksheet, what it means, and then we'll run a couple different scenarios changing the numbers. So to do that, let's just recap what we have thus far. Think about how the changes we make should flow through the worksheet into the rest of the practice problem. So our data is on the left hand side. We got the purchase price. This is obviously something that we could change if we so choose, and then it should flow through to the rest of the problem. We would, we would have to update the pivot table, but all of our other data is not reliant on the pivot table. So even if the pivot, pivot table gets a little messed up, it's okay because we're not calculating the rest of the data based on it. We could, of course, change the initial rent calculation. That's our starting point, the cash outflow that we're renting. Then thinking about purchasing, whether or not that be a good financial decision purely from a financial perspective. We've got the rental growth rate. This is basically tied into inflation, also something that you can vary and, and look at what changes would do. This is an item that probably would be most likely to change and you run different scenarios. The property growth rate, the equity and the property, given the fact that we're investing a significant amount of money, leveraging or taking a loan out in order to do so significantly means that adjusting this rate might have a big impact, of course, on uh, the returns that we would have you also might want to try a negative <laughs> amount there and see what would happen you know if you had if you had a decline and then we have the insurance and uh, the maintenance of course these expenses you can adjust the inflation for them as well which would be tied into in essence inflation rate around two to three percent we would think marginal tax rate that would be dependent on someone's individual tax rate. Remember, that's the highest rate, not the average. The capital gains also dependent on the individual may not be as applicable given the fact that there's a huge exemption oftentimes. And then we got the property taxes. And those are going to be subject to your local area. The selling expenses and then our loan calculations, which of course you could try putting more or less down in terms of the loan, adjust the loan interest rates and so on with the loan as we make these adjustments it should flow through the rest of the table amortization table being adjusted by the loan adjustment calculations pivot table would have to be adjusted by right clicking and refreshing the pivot table but even if the pivot table gets glitchy it doesn't impact the rest of the calculations because we did the rest of the calculations without the pivot table so then should update the loan summary the loan summary over here broken out with the years on the horizontal axis property values then going up at the two percent if we vary it from something other than two percent we'd have an adjustment here cash flow from home purchase before taxes so now we're looking at the cash flow in the event that we purchased the home not taking into consideration the initial down payment or the sale those considering later then we'll take into consideration the tax impact then we have the cash flow after taxes all this should update automatically as we make adjustments to our data on the left hand side then we have the cash flows from the renting information which also could be adjusted if we adjust the inflation rate it's going up at that two percent the difference between the two the net cash outflow in essence meaning if we go from renting to purchasing we still have an outflow until year 12 where we actually then start to have a net inflow if we go to the home purchase under this scenario we have the cash flow from from the sale of the home then calculating it calculating the tax implication if there is any and then we've got the cash flow uh, after taxes now we have our table down here so our table then is attempting to see, you know, what is this a good investment or not? It's an intimidating looking table. But if we break it down, it's similar to a capital investment type of decision. In essence, just looking at the cash flows. So let's just pick a year here. Let's pick like year 
uh, let's pick year 15, just go right in the middle, year 15. And then I'm, I'm going to make that green so we can see it. And so then the, the cash flows on that would be that we put the 80,000 down up front. And then we had still a net outflow if we go and we're thinking about this from going from a rental perspective, having to pay rent to the purchase, putting 80,000 down up front and then having the loan. The loan isn't a cash flow, just the cash flow is the down payment. Then when we pay off the loan, then we have the cash flow. This is the difference between the cash flows. We still have more cash flow going out in the purchase scenario than the renting scenario. This is the cash flow for year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. I believe these are the right year six, year seven, year eight, year nine, year 10, and so on. And then, of course, the cash flow turns positive. That's because the rental amount, the amount in order to rent, is going up at 2%, where we locked in the interest rate on the home purchase. So the major amount of the home purchase is, is locked down. So we actually have the positive flow out here. And then we assume we sell it in year 15. That means we're going to realize the, the gain related to the increase in the value of the home. And we realize the gain at that point in time. Obviously, when you think about the, the benefits of this, you got to also think about your cash flow situation to see if, it's, if you can deal with the fact that you, you still could have these cat, this big down payment up front and then in terms of, of the down payment and then the, the net outflows in order to hopefully get access to the increase in the property value, which then could be taken out with regards to the selling of the home or in, in say, a loan refinance possibly situation so you can access increase in the equity. So that means if we add that up, we're at the 166,697. That's the net cash flow, but that's over 15 years. So the question is, could I, could I have taken this information or this, this money, the 80,000 upfront, and all, all these net payments on the negative and done invested it somewhere else and so on at a, at a, and get a similar return. Would it be worthwhile to put the money in there in order to calculate that or to think about that? We want to take into consideration time value of money. So we use the IRR calculation, which is the rate at which this series of payments would be zero if we kind of, if we discounted it back. So just to get a, an idea of what that means, Let's take this year 15 and actually actually present value it back a couple different ways so we could see see what this is telling us. So let's put that up top here and what we're going to recreate the cash flow and then we'll take our present value calculations of it. So we're going to call this I'm going to put this up top and say this is going to be cash flow and pre present value or PV for at let's say sale at year 15. So we're just going to recreate those cash flows as if we sold it after 15 years. Let's make this blue and white as has been our custom blue and white. And then this first column is going to be our description column. So I'm just going to make it a little bit larger and then we'll start our years here. So zero, one, two, and then I'll copy that across. We only need to go out 15 years because we're going to sell it after 15 years. So I'm just going to copy it out to 15 instead of 30. I went way too far. You've gone too far because I thought we were going out to 30. But no, 15 years, we're going to say black and white. There we got it. Let's make this black and white again. And this is going to be the years. Okay, so then we have the cash flow. So we got cash flow sale 15 after 15 years which is going to be equal to and we're just going to copy over the cash flow over here in the 15 year range so we put that 80,000 down up front 80,000 down up front and then we'll just copy that across so there we have it putting our cursor back on the 80,000 we'll just copy that across to the 15 years pulling over our cash flow and then we'll just sum it up just like we did before this will be the total and this will be the IRR, the internal rate of return. This equals the sum of the cash flows. And we've recreated then that cash flow, the 166,697. And then the IRR, the rate at which this cash flow is zero. IRR 
is the sum of, or the IRR of these items, the internal rate of return of these items. It doesn't have the ring to it like the sum function. But then we're going to say this is going to be the percent, adding some decimals. So we're going to say the rate at which this series of payments would be zero is the seventh 12. So let's think about that a little bit more in depth here. I'm going to make this black and white. I'm going to center it. Let's make this like a different color, like green, because it's our total column. And then I'm going to copy that rate over here so that I can, I can use it in a formula and then adjust it if we so choose. I'm going to copy that, that rate so this equals the 7.12, making that a percent, percent, adding some decimals to it. And then let's, what we want to do just to get an idea, just to know what this means is let's discount back basically our entire cash flow here at that rate. And what we'll end up with is, is basically a zero, which hopefully will give us a better idea of, you know, what we're talking about when we look at the internal rate of return. So to, to think about that, let's take each of these cash flow payments, discount it back to period zero, and then, and then we'll sum it up using that rate, the IRR rate. So in other words, if I discounted $80,000 back to period zero, it would be 80,000 because I'm at period zero. If I took this net outflow, this is an outflow over and above what I would be paying with rent, and I pulled it back to period zero, then we want to say what would be the value at present value at present value dollars. Because re remember, this is an outflow that we would have had over and above the renting because we'd have the down payment to purchase in period zero. This is an outflow over and above, in essence, what we'd have with the renting because we had to pay more in terms of our outflows for the home purchase than the renting. So the question is, you know, what what could what else could we do with that or what would be the rate of return we're getting on these outflows with basically the sale of the property at the end of the end when we've realized the gain. So to think about that, we have to discount everything back to period zero. And what's the discount rate that we're going to use? That's obviously kind of the question. You could think about it. What's the hurdle rate I want to have? in order to justify the investment or what's the rate at which it would be zero so let's discount these back and see if that gives us a better idea we'll use our present value calculations discounting this one back just one year then two years and three years and so on which we can copy across so it's going to be this negative present value shift nine the rate i'm going to use of this rate on the left hand side we're going to use this rate this the 7.12 going to make that absolute F4 on the keyboard dollar sign before the BW and the 66 comma the number of periods I'm going to pull from this one up top I want to not hard code it not type it in in other words but pull it from the reference up top so we can copy it across and it'll move across comma we don't have a payment because this is not an annuity so two commas and then the future value is going to be this amount which you can't see, but it's in that cell right there, BE66, that we're pulling back. So if I say enter, we got that cell pulled back now to current year dollars at the discount rate, using the discount rate of the 7.12, which is going to be that 3,163. Let's do it one more time, and then we'll copy it across. Negative, present value, shift 9, rate is going to be this item on the left hand side the 7.12 f4 on the keyboard making it absolute comma the number of periods is two now pulling that two from the item up top not hard coding it so we can copy it across comma no payment because it's not an annuity but present value of one comma and then we'll pick up the amount and enter so that 3082 discounted back at that seven something rate for two years, it's worth in current year dollars, uh, 2,685. So you can see what we're doing. We're taking these flows and we're discounting them back to the current current year dollars. So there we have it. So if we discount them all back in current year dollars, assuming a discount rate of 7.12, that 7.12 could include the rate of return we want in for our, our return on the investment in there as well. So we got, there we have it. We can copy it one one place over to the to the left, but it'll get to the same number because it's the eighty thousand, and obviously that's at period zero, so no change. So this is our present value, cent value, 
PV calculation. So then we can sum that up, basically the present value dollars here, summing this up, and it comes out to be zero. Now that zero doesn't mean that we didn't make any money through this time frame. It means that we got the return of the 7.12 in essence. That's the rate at which this series of payments is zero. So in other words, that rate right there could include, it's not just inflation, in other words, that rate, it could include our rate of return. So for example, if I thought inflation was 2%, then I could say inflation was 2%, and then I discount these dollars back at the 2%, then we've got the 99,804 in terms of the present value dollars discounting all the, all the cash flows back at the 2%. So when you're looking at the rate of return, this is the rate of return that you can kind of compare to other projects, and it usually would include the, the amount that you would want as your return, what you think would be a justifiable return in terms of a percentage basis in order to take on one project and or invest in something and or judge whether you should invest in one thing versus in essence another thing, taking into consideration the rate of return, which should also kind of be calculated in there, your risk, the risk that would be involved in different kind of investments. So let's go ahead and make this, this, uh, this the colors put the colors in here that's what we're that's what we do here make it look nice got to make it look nice so we're going to make it blue we're going to make this one blue and bordered blue and bordered and then we'll put the brackets around this now just the next thing you could take a look at is if we were to change our data on the left hand side so let's just change, let's assume then that the property growth rate actually goes down. So we'll have like a worst case type of scenario. There's a decline in the property. Now note if there's a decline and you're doing this purely for investment purposes, obviously that could be bad and you want to hedge your bets that a decline could happen so you can mitigate the risk. If you're living in the home and you, can, you like where you're at, and you're able to pay the, the expenses related to it, then it's depressing that it goes down, but it's not really financially devastating because you're able to make the payments and so on as you go forward. So in any case, go into the left-hand side to the right to see our calculations. Uh, if there was any change to the pivot table, you would have to refresh the pivot table, although there were no changes to the loan calculation. So that should be the same. The amortization table holds together. The loan summary then is going to be, in essence, the same. The property value now decreasing in value, and it's doing it automatically by that 2% decline. The cash flow from the home purchase before taxes calculation, basically the same, but the property taxes are actually going down if they actually reassess the property taxes as the property went down. And then we got the cash flow from the purchase for tax savings. So we got the tax implications, which could have an impact with regards to the property value going down. We got the cash flow after taxes. The renting remained the same. We didn't change any assumptions there. So now we've got our net cash flow. We're still got a net cash flow outflow until year eight, as opposed to year 12, which it was before. We got the cash flow from the sale of the home. So we still have the sale process taking place, but we're not getting the same return we were hoping for. And then we're not going to have any tax implications because we're going to be we're going to have a loss instead of a gain. Therefore, no tax implications with regards to paying taxes on the gain for for capital gains. Then we've got the cash flow from the sale of the home after taxes. Here, looking at our table, let's just take a look at year 15 again. We had the 80,000 outflow. These are the net outflows over the renting. They flipped at year eight. And then we've got the inflows. And then if we sold it, we're not getting what we wanted, but we still have a cash inflow at the sale uh, 15 years out. And then of course, we've got our negative you know, cash flow with the total cash flows and our return at the negative uh, 3.81. So you can kind of map out this, the, the negative scenario. You got a positive cash flow starting down here in this year, I don't know what year exactly that is. And, th and then you can see the returns after that point in time. Notice we're still up to 513, even though it went down over that long period of time. I believe that would be because we had these positive, significant positive cash flows after year eight here from the difference between what the rental increase would be and, and uh, in, our, in our price there. So let's Let's do one more. Let's take a look at one more over here because that was like a depressing scenario. We don't want to leave on a depressing scenario. So let's make it, 
Let's make it like a five. Let's say it goes up 5%. Let's see what that will do. So we got the 5%, no change to the amortization table. We don't need to update the pivot table. If you did anything to the loan, you'd have to right click and update the pivot table. But we're not really reliant on the pivot table anyways, because we reconstructed the loan information is in essence the same. Property value going up substantially now at the 5% other than the 2% all the way out here at 30 goes up past a million to 1 million 728 so big difference in terms of the increase and in the value if we were to increase it by the five percent over the entire 30 years here cash flow for the home purchase then we've got the property tax value now going up substantially so our cash flow is actually going up more substantially than it otherwise would given the property taxes would be going up insurance is, and going up to the same rate same with the maintenance the loan payments then are the same but we have that increase in the property tax, which makes it go up a little bit more significantly. We also have the tax savings. That property tax could lead to tax savings as well. Although if we cap them at 10,000, they get capped all the way or all already at year 12. And then they get capped out. So it kind of depends on the tax law in terms of the benefit there with regards to the property value and the taxes going up. Then we got the cash flow. So this is the total cash flow after taxes. Comparing that to the scenario, which was the same. Note down here, it's interesting that we have a benefit that the property is going up in value. But if we compare it to the rent, we actually still have this outflow that is actually still increasing. It doesn't flip in year 12. And we still have this all the way out, all the way out to year 30 under this scenario, the way we got it set up here, that it's still an outflow more of an outflow on the purchase versus the renting due in part to the fact that the property value going up means that the property taxes is going up the way we have it calculated that would depend of course on where you're located to see if that to, to see if they reassess it each year but that's that and then we got the cash flow from the sale of the property so now we got the the sale of the property minus the costs that would be involved and then the loan amount the loan stays the same but the sales price as the prior scenarios because we haven't touched the loan balances but we've got our cash inflows so those are nice we've got our tax implications which would kick in sooner now due to the fact that we have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar exemption that's for single that's wiping it out it would be 500 possibly if married but then it starts to kick in in year 12 instead of basically it was only like the last three years in the prior scenario that we have a gain that is now over the 250 exemption we're assuming 15 percent tax rate instead of our marginal tax rate or our, our capital gains rate we're going to say it's 15 so we got these tax taxations all the way out on the sales component at that point so then taking that into consideration we've got the cash sale uh, from the home after taxes which kicks in and is different after we get out here because we're subtracting out the the sale or the amount of the taxes so here's how much cash we got paying the government and so we got the net amount and then if we took a look at our cash flow let's bring it on down to year 15 again we've got the 80,000 initial outflow we've got more outflows that are going out over and above the rental amount on the purchase side all the way out for the whole time frame we're always paying more out for the whole time frame that we're owning the property which we got to consider if you have the cash flow in order to to be able to do that but if the property value goes out and we can goes up at that rate i believe it was five percent we said and we can realize that at the end and we realize it here at year 15 and sell it we've got that net inflow of the 515 uh, 640 so if we then consider that then we're looking at the 11.6 in terms of our rate of return, the 399, 476 in the net cash flow over that 15 year time frame. And again, you could see the, the cash flow as well as the rate of return. If you were to consider that over here and looking at that 15 year, if we discounted this back then at that 11%, same concept, we'd get to zero. If we discounted it back, say at 2%, that stream of payments then we're getting to basically a present value in essence in terms of purchasing power we're considering there of the 383 128 i'm sorry of the total amount of the 271 474 in terms of current value dollars if i total 
that whole stream up and discount it back at 2%, considering in essence, that's the inflation rate. So we've got this cash kind of net outflow that we're investing in essence the whole time here. And then the question is, what's the rate of return given that big inflow that could potentially happen at the end, given the value of the equity going up at the end, the rate of return at which that would be zero, which would be including the gain in the calculation being that 1160, meaning if we discount it at that rate, that's the rate at which the stream of payments discounting back to zero uh, would be would be zero. So that's going to be the idea of it. So you can use this again to run different scenarios or adjust it to, to your particular circumstances, make it more or less complex or customize it to your needs.